we're going to move swiftly on to our next business, which is our penultimate session of the day. This is club ownership, safeguarding sport from criminal infiltration. And um, I was going to say I'd like to call my panel up, but they've already beaten me to it, which is great because we'll crack straight on. Um, and if I could just introduce, introduce them all at the very top. Uh, so closest to me is uh, Claudius Schaefer, who is uh, joining us from the Swiss League. Claudius, thanks very much indeed for making the long journey here. Um, uh, uh, next to Claudius is uh, Ronan O'Lara, who's the Associate Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Officer at the UNODC. Ronan, thanks for being here. Chris Eaton is a familiar face, I'm sure, to many of you. Um, Chris Eaton is the Director of Sport Integrity uh, at the ICSS. Uh, and Nicola Bonucci is Director of Legal at the OECD. So, gents, thank you all very much indeed for coming. Um, I mean, we're looking at a proliferation of styles of club ownership that has grown up over the course of the last few years in particular, the last couple of decades, I suppose. Um, Nicola, it, it's, a, it's a messy situation, isn't it? Um, you said it. Uh, now, let's... Um, I, I was very intrigued, but in fact, I was very happy to have been invited to this particular panel because usually... I'm more invited to talk about corruption and anti-corruption. So here I take it more from the corporate governance point of view, which is an, another area of work of the activity uh, very much present in the OECD work. So let's um, I agree on three basic propositions, and I hope we all agree. Football, let's take football, uh, but this is, can be true also of professional basketball, but let's take football. Football is much more than a sport. It is also a business. Second... It is a business, but it is not any kind of business. Um, third, the majority of football clubs are privately owned and basically not really transparently managed. Now, if we translate those three propositions into a corporate sector, let's assume that we have a sector in Switzerland or any other country in the world in which um, the companies are not listed on the stock exchange uh, are family-owned uh, or single-owned uh, and are not submitted basically to any corporate governance or company law. Uh, however, these companies are generating a lot of money, but they are still not for profit in most of the cases. The shareholders of these uh, companies, uh, which in, 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 uh, in the football would be the fans, are completely conflicted in a sense because what they want is the company to be the number one at all costs. They don't really care a lot about the corporate governance structure because they are fans of the company. Or they are relatives of the family, so in any case they are also conflicted. And the object of the corporation is to be number one at all costs. Would you have trust in any corporate, corporate sector which, which would have those as pillars of, of uh, the governance. So I think there, and naturally, no real corporate social responsibility at the end of the day because you need to be number one. So I think this, I mean, I don't want to exaggerate, but this is, those are the challenges that are facing football clubs. They were originated in a spirit, they have evolved dramatically, but the governance has not evolved uh, at all in the same pace and speed. So, and I will stop here. My basic proposition is that there should be minimum rules for club to obey with minimum corporate governance requirements, full disclosure of capital structure and control arrangements, including very important beneficial ownership, because I think this is a particular important issue um, in, the, in the sector, and naturally for this to work, because there is a competition and we should be uh, rec recognizing that there is a competition, this cannot be done solely at the national level, there should be an international agreement. J just before you put that away, just explain beneficial ownership, for just in case there are a few people who are... Okay, so basically you need to know at the end of the day who is the natural person behind the, all the legal structures. It's all very nice to know that uh, you know, Football X is in the hands of investment company X and Y, which itself is in the hands of 
uh, equity uh, company uh, based in Barbados. And at the end of the day, who is the natural person behind that? Actually, to be honest and transparent also, given that <laughs> this is the subject, this is not an issue only limited to football club. I think beneficial ownership is a big issue in all the international discussion. In fact, the G20 last year adopted some high-level principle for beneficial ownership for corporations. One of the problems is that, again, football club not being considered corporate in a number of countries, or not all of them, uh, even those principles in principle <laughs> do not apply to, to football. But the beneficial ownership is crucial. You need to be able to say, at the end of the day, who's the natural person who's controlling uh, the football club. Okay, Chris, I mean, there are the shadier characters, there are the downright criminals, there's the organized crime. Just give us a flavor of the, the extent of this problem. Well, well, the scale of it is enormous, really, because, because as Nicola has pointed out, the variety of company structures and uh, ownership structures in, uh, in clubs, ranging from those at the Premier League, the wealthy clubs, the wealthy football clubs in the USA, uh, don't forget they're probably the wealthiest clubs in the world in many respects, uh, right down to those impoverished clubs and leagues. You know, probably well over half clubs are either insolvent or in debt. This makes them ripe red apples for organised crime anyway. And when you can hide these, uh, the beneficial ownership of, uh, of, the, of these clubs through uh, all sorts of uh, offshore accounts and offshore uh, equity funds, etc., which is quite common, unfortunately, in a lot of business, but unlike a lot of business, sport does not have the due diligence or the oversight or the supervision even the club licensing aspects are only scattily done across the world. There are very few countries and uh, federations that have a club licensing system, for instance. So, Ronan, it, it is as simple as that. It, it, that is what makes them so appealing to the criminal fraternity. Um, yeah, I, I suppose from the UN perspective, which is uh, just to clarify, I'm from the UN's Office on Drugs and Crime, so I, I might uh, disappoint a few here by, I, I won't suggest we should have UN uh, peacekeepers uh, <laughs> involved in this process, but, but certainly um, from our point of view, what we're looking at are the conduits that facilitate um, transnational, transnational organized crime. And um, more and more what we're seeing, uh, we're, we're getting requests from governments and, uh, governments and sporting agencies, is to help um, develop coordinated global approaches to help them guide um, their reactions and their responses, which up to now have been typically uh, knee-jerk in a certain sense, uh, dare I say it. Um, and so we're, we certainly see this, this issue of transnational organized crime as a problem that needs to be addressed at an institutional level. And linking that to club ownership is obviously key in this. I mean, we have to understand, um, uh, as Nicola was pointing out, um, who, who owns these clubs, how are they being run. Um, and um, I, I think what would help, from our point of view at least, is to frame that question in one of um, criminal justice. So we're not just looking at how um, organizations are being mismanaged, not run properly, but how they actually impact on the public. And unfortunately, up to now, we haven't seen a, a, a coordinated approach. We haven't seen um, legislation uh, that, that's useful, or at least uh, um, that, that's overarching. And uh, you know, what, what the UN is trying to do now is trying to rely on international instruments such as the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime, as well as the UN Convention Against Corruption, we see these as sort of helpful frameworks to mobilize and guide governments in developing um, proactive policies to sort of counteract the use and abuse of these clubs. Because at the end of the day, what, what we're trying to do is there are many cogs in the wheels that facilitate transnational organized crimes. Um, limiting the way in which they can be greased is what, we want, what we're trying to do here. And um, giving the tools to clubs and clubs, uh, club ownership structures to stop that from happening, to stop them being abused is certainly the way we see uh, a way forward. And um, just to reiterate, this is why we see these type of events, like um, in cooperation with ICSS, but uh, as well as other international organizations as a way to, to, to move that agenda forward. 
Claudius, you, you can, I know, give us a sp specific example, if you like, of how, how difficult it can be to deal with people who come in and legitimately seem to purchase a club, and it's not all as it seems. <laughs> yeah, we made uh, many bad experiences with uh, so-called investors from abroad. I, I really say so-called investors. Uh, one uh, that is known uh, was a so-called investor from Chechny, and he came to, uh, to a nice city in Switzerland called Neuchâtel with a club with a huge tradition, Neuchâtel Xamax, playing in the first division, Super League. Uh, the former uh, owner wanted to uh, sell the club, and the only one apparently was interested was this Chechen, and he was coming to Switzerland. Uh, the medias were writing, oh, that's a big name, is uh, like... Uh, Abramovich, a billionaire, we will play uh, Champions League next year and uh, the stadium will be full next year. And uh, unfortunately, it was not like this. Uh, the history uh, was just half a year. And uh, after half a year, uh, we had to sort of throw out, throwing out this club from, from the first division. And then we uh, ended the championship with nine clubs. And this is a disaster for, uh, for a league. It's, uh, for the image, it's not good. For, for the players, for, all the, 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 for the city of Neuchâtel. Uh, and 10 days after um, we, that they had to, to stop the championship, they went bankrupt. Uh, this mister um, from um, Chechenia went into jail and was then, uh, he had to, to leave Switzerland, um, I think four or five months uh, later and he is now uh, away. And uh, there is a, uh, a loss of, I think, 30 millions. And so th that's the thing, uh, the things we are facing uh, mostly with, 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 uh, with, with presidents or investors uh, from abroad. It's not, it's not the only uh, example we have, but it's, it's the worst. And there was nothing you could have done, sorry Chris, I'll come to you in a minute about that, there was nothing you could have done um, prior to the purchase to have uh, uh, assessed the, the reality of his position? The problem was that uh, on this moment uh, the club had uh, the license and um, this, this investor came after the licensing procedure so we couldn't do something. That's why we now changed the regulations. Now, it's, we had uh, two, three months ago, uh, FC Wiel uh, is a club of uh, second division of Challenge League who was, no, who was now bought by uh, a Turkish camp company and they had to undergo uh, a new licensing procedure after the so-called normal licensing procedure. But this uh, doesn't give you a guarantee, uh, you know. This is, uh, the problem is that uh, those people are still in, in, in their country and it's quite difficult, uh, uh, difficult to, to, to manage this with, with those clubs. Right, okay, Chris. I, I was gonna say, this is an all too common story uh, and this is a sophisticated jurisdiction. Mm. But imagine what's happening in unsophisticated jurisdictions. You know, organized crime loves the dark and club ownership of all sports is in the dark. It is not regulated like any business. It does not have oversight, know your customer due diligence rules, such as applies to most business in a global sense. It's time for these organisations to grow up. They are global organisations that have to act like global businesses, recognising their, their, their individuality too. They need to have a good governance structure as well. You know, we are seeing that not just cash transactions here, in-kind transactions, the kind benefactor who comes, I offer you a coach, I offer you players, I offer you facilities. Uh, and this is clearly a criminal using journeyman players to come and take control of clubs. We're seeing this commonly now in third and fourth division clubs around the world. But, but uh, of course, in the short term, it seems beneficial to the club. They're not going to want to create a fuss. They don't do any due diligence, do they? they? They don't know what they're getting into. They just simply see a benefactor coming to it. They might not even recognise the criminality, but I'm sure in the back of their mind they know what they're doing, really. But they're, they're making their clubs, as I said, the vast majority of football clubs around the world are insolvent, technically insolvent. Without government money, they would not survive. Yeah, I, I think it, 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 it goes back to, to the point I was trying to make. Um, I don't know how the decision was taken um, in, in the Neuchatel Club. I'm sure, I'm sure that there was a consultation of the board of the club and everybody was happy for this source of money. Now, again, if you translate this into a normal corporation, you would have independent directors which are not necessarily linked to the club, mm. which will start to ask the questions about, well, okay, what 
how is this money, what is the origin of the source of the fortune of this, uh, uh, of this, of this person? This is what happens in a normal company. Uh, in a normal company, n not everyone can come, even with a big check, and say, I'm, I'm going to buy the company uh, uh, without having to answer uh, the origin and the source of the money. And this is one of, bi one of the big issues, because I think at the end of the day, the, the panel is talk talking about criminal infiltration, but I think it, it goes beyond. It, as I said, I, it goes, in, in my view, the heart is really to have much more due diligence on uh, who is the beneficiary of ownership, much more structure, corporate governance structure, which can ensure the check and balance that in other areas of business exist. And I think I'm not, no, I'm not, I, I think you, uh, Chris is right. They were probably a bit naive. Uh, and I think it's fair because those people were not used to deal with this kind of issues, uh, big business and big money. Uh, so there is also a level of education of all the people involved in the management of clubs. You need real financial experts. You need people where, who have forensic expertise. You need to, if you have doubt, you need to, I mean, there are a number of companies who, who, who are equipped to assess, uh, you know, what is the person about, what is the background. Maybe you need to make due diligence uh, checks mandatory. Those are the answers that exist in, in, the, in the normal business community, uh, but not in the football sector. Sounds example. like it's getting pricey up that end of the table a little bit. Sorry, Claude, in order to jump in. I understand what you're saying, but you, you're talking about big companies. You know, when you, when you, you face the problem in, in Switzerland, we have a, a challenge league club, for example, like FC Wiel, they have a budget of, I don't know, they had, they had a budget of around three, three, maybe four million Swiss francs. And to do all these check, checks uh, when an, a new uh, investor uh, is coming, that's quite difficult. And also for us as a league, we have a club licensing system that is, is very severe. Uh, people are telling us, people, for, uh, businessmen who are coming to clubs, that uh, maybe in the banking sector they have such controls, but uh, in, in other businesses, not at all. And we, what we can do are some controls, but it's not, not, uh, it's not possible, uh, all the, the work um, you just explained. Difficulty is not impossibility. And uh, the fact is that almost all small businesses around the world have to conform to business uh, rules and regulations, and they're more regulated than, than, than sport clubs. That's the problem. And even small businesses that generate only thousands of dollars a week still have to report on the way in which they, uh, their accounts are, are maintained and their income is, uh, is generated. So I don't accept that argument. I think the fact is that, uh, that uh, sport clubs still think of themselves as clubs, but they want to operate as, as money-making businesses. And this, this diarchic dichotomy they have on their identity, are we a business, are we a club, or are we a set blood that says a family? Well, you're neither. You are something very unique, certainly. We debated that this morning. Unique is not the word. Special, perhaps, in terms of circumstance. But you must ensure that the governor's responsibility is standalone, such as Nicola just mentioned, that uh, the companies look sincerely and very, very uh, uh, routinely at investors to make sure they are the right type of investor for their company image, for their company uh, uh, outcome and for their company future. That is not happening routinely in sport clubs. It just must. But, but sorry, just on that point, I know Ronan, you want to get in, but on that point of image, there are loads of... Uh, um, oligarchs, billionaires, squillionaires, you name it, who come in and take over clubs, and those clubs run well. I mean, it's not fair to say they don't all run well. So it's, I'm just uh, feeling it's, it can be difficult, can't it, to know, particularly with foreign owners. Are there, are there greater, more stringent measures you should be taking against foreign owners then than any others? Because it is difficult to know what the reality of their situation is and where their money comes from. And... Due diligence is one thing, but can you get to the bottom of where a, a, a Russian or a Chechen actually got all his money from? It's a question. I'm going to come in and say it's not. It's, it's difficult, certainly. It is not impossible. I come back to difficult is fine. Difficult exists in the world all around the world. You know, it is not impossible to find out. And that's the purpose of, uh, of, of due diligence, the purpose of taking, uh, you know, obviously some global approach as well. We actually come to sport probably needing a mechanism whereby I can tap into this information as banks do. So we do, we, we come back to this original 
debate again this morning. What is the mechanism to help sport to mature itself into the right model? It does need, it's a global business, a global operating uh, uh, governance structure. It needs then a globally support mechanism to make sure that it has the right information to make these, these decisions. Okay, we'll have a little discussion about how that might come about in, in a moment or two. Ronan, sorry, you were very patient there. Yeah, no, um, actually, Chris basically got to my point because uh, what I was going to ask was, okay, we identified the problem, but how do we get to the point where we want to solve it? Mm. Which is also, quite simply, we're talking about amateur and professional clubs here. We're talking also, we're talking, I mean, um, you know, we have to think perhaps, in a, uh, you know, I suppose, with the UN hat on, more of a global global understanding of what's going on here, because we, I mean, I've followed the Premier League, you know, I have my favourite clubs, oligarchs, um, you know, very rich individuals, families, you, you hear this over and over again, but there's many other leagues around the world, um, I'm thinking particularly in Asia, uh, around the Pacific area as well, um, um, the Indian subcontinent, Th these are areas, uh, grey zones, which we also have to think about, when we're looking at um, addressing this problem. Because you shut the door in one um, area of the world, it opens somewhere else. And so I, I, I like Chris's idea of the sort of, the, um, as a, uh, sort of like a clearing house or, or yeah. a body of some sort that can help give guidance. Because at the end of the day, and, and sorry, this is where the original question came from, was that, okay, we have the problem, but who is actually going to be the, the solution Who's going to be the, the, the solution maker? We can't just rely on law enforcement for that. You know, well, you have to talk about the, you know, the, the, the volunteer at yeah. the local club who's running the books. I mean, is that really the person we want to be looking at? Or you know, what, what, what is the litmus test for when we want to start looking and imposing policy and burdens on clubs? Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that, you know, and sorry, I, I'm like Nicola, I come from the anti-corruption world, and often we're, we found ourselves being accused of saying, okay, let's turn every single organization we work with into an anti-corruption organization, and then they can do what else they're, what else they're doing. So, you know, you have to, you know, a health authority uh, should, you know, uh, filter out corruption practices first. The point is that whatever we do will have a massive burden, and we have to make sure that the burden is, you know, focused on the right people. Let, let's, let's say one thing. Francois Carrard will not come up with a solution for a start. Sport cannot of itself come up with a solution. Uh, this is a, a, say, a global scoped business problem and a problem of identity and a problem of due diligence, a problem of proper accountability. It must have information. For the moment, sport, sport organisations, clubs, whether they're professional, amateur or semi-professional, there's many semi-professional clubs where there's money involved but players aren't paid, for instance. They also need to be regulated and oversighted and supervised. They actually need to be licensed like they are in, uh, in uh, Switzerland. The vast majority of, of countries do not have club licensing systems. This is a very important first start, simply licensing clubs so they are, they are therefore accountable and measurable in some way. But honestly, organised crime is deeply in sport today. You cannot avoid that reality. So you must have deeply surgical solutions to it as well. It is not about talking about uh, you know, reform. This is not reform, this is rebuilding. Rebuilding business structures, building club structures and making sure they are accountable and they are responsible. Well, okay, um, I, I get that. I appreciate that that is uh, the challenge as, as you would see it. At the same time, are there areas within, because you said at the start, sport can't deal with this itself. Are there areas, and you might have an example, Claudius, where sport has, can potentially and has brought in changes which have made a difference. I mean, we're going to talk in the next session mm. uh, about club licensing, for example, about uh, FIFA, TMS, certain things, areas which are obviously mm. tools to help. But you, had, you, you got badly bitten. What sort of measures did you bring in afterwards which have tightened your game? <coughs> The thing what we introduced was, as I said, like uh, another uh, licensing procedure if there is a, a change in club ownership. That's the thing that what we did. We, ha we, we, ha we didn't have this before. Um, but now we are also thinking um, to, to introduce uh, even uh, stricter rules uh, because after this case we had uh, other uh, cases from investors from, from abroad in Berlinzona, uh, in here in Geneva also uh, with uh, somebody of, of uh, the state of Iran. 
And uh, so we, we have to face uh, the problem of, um, of these uh, investors from abroad. What can we do? But it, it will be very difficult to find solutions just for, for people from abroad, you know. Uh, well, so that's uh, a bit, it's all, is there a distinction to be made here and, as well? And, and maybe, maybe once uh, there is a club, uh, a big club also in Switzerland, that uh, um, is bought by somebody uh, of, I don't know, of, of Russia, and it can be a, a, good, a good solution. I, I think maybe, um, well, for, first, uh, I, I fully agree with what, what has been said by, 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 the, the, by the previous speakers. I, I think we should be, even though I was maybe blunt in my first intervention, there are a number of issues which go beyond sport. A beneficial ownership, as I said, is a big issue which go beyond sport. Uh, no, uh, opaque... Uh, control structure, use of offshore is a big issue which goes beyond sport. What, what is true, however, is that because of what it, we just said, the, the massive development, the globalization of sport has been so quick with, with staggering figures. You know, I, I, I was, I was uh, reading uh, just coming now on the train that this year the English club spent five times what they spent five years ago in terms of recruitment, five times. You know, you don't have any many business, li business line like that. Uh, actually, I, I think a lot of business will be, will love to have this kind of incredible uh, uh, curbs. Um, or another figure which I read yesterday uh, on the FT, first page of the FT, I don't know if you read this article on Macau, uh, the casinos. The, okay, the casino lost 24% this year because there is a bit of fight, a bit, of fight against corruption in China. They are still making five times more money than Las Vegas, than casinos in Macau. Five times. So how many people are going physically to Macau to bet in the casinos? Much fewer than people going to Las Vegas. So there is a lot of money going another way. So the mass of money that has been generated in the last 10, 20 years, it's incredible. And even though those issues are not structural or not limited to sport, sport was a weak target. I mean, the clubs were an easy spot, and they're still an easy spot. So I think a lot can be done both very with very simple requirements of transparency. For example, you could very well imagine that, as it exists in a number of other areas, if there start to be negotiation for changing the partnership, these have to be announced in, in advance. Uh, uh, to be, you know, inform basic information has to be given to the federation or to, mm. to the authorities. This may by itself already get out of the most mm. egregious cases of laundering or uh, other p points like that. Due diligence, you know, it's amazing the amount of mo uh, information that you can retrieve by Google. I don't want to make publicity, but, you know, Internet gives you a very substantial, uh, substantial amount of information. It's not so difficult to, to ask to a person uh, who, who, is, uh, who has some intelligence to, why, why don't you spend a, a few hours to try to dig uh, some information about this wonderful tycoon which nobody heard about it until two days ago? Well, I don't, uh, I don't, don't, I don't want to be you know, negative on this, but you know, if you then bring him in because you didn't find anything, it doesn't stand up very well when you say, well, I did Google him. He seemed okay. No, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's Google's Google's a good start. Google's well, a good start. It's better than <laughs> It's a good start, but that's why I said earlier we do need some sort of global mechanism for the for, for ease of access to this sort of due diligence information, which banks now have, insurance companies now have quite formal systems that enable due diligence officers to do proper checks on individuals, know your customer, etc. But I think Nicola mentioned something very important. That is the casinos in Macau. Sport betting is vastly bigger than sport itself, and it's a feeder mechanism of sport. It is also one of the most dark industries in the world, most easy to, for criminals to infiltrate and to defraud. So this, this duality of sport betting and sport now, which is inextricably linked, is creating this feeder mechanism for organised crime. We have to stop it. it, is, it sport and, and sport betting is bleeding because of this. Now, you asked what are the best models, what are good models, successful models. I believe the US franchise model with commissioners over each sport is a very good model because it marries the issue, the, the self-admitted and self-confessed issue of business. They're there to make money, these sports in America, but the commissioner's role is to keep the sport honest, keep the governance of the sport in tune with its original values. 
Can, can you do that with, I mean, we're talking so many thousands of clubs involved in transfers, et cetera, around the world in football, for example. Could you bring that model in, do you think, an American model? Well, I think it's a model that probably can be used, but there are other models too. I mean, I, I can, I'm, I'm sure there are other models that are workable, but this is a model that works in the most uh, uh, cash-rich society uh, of the world, the richest society of the world in the US. And it's, it's made their sports very resilient and very successful. Some sports right now, internationally, are not so resilient. They're very successful, but they're not...